Good afternoon. I am Jeffrey Ogbar, Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. I am here with the esteemed historian and also a friend of mine, Dr. Jacob Dorman. And I'm very excited today to talk about his uh, latest release, an outstanding book with rave reviews and um, a history that is incredibly discursive, exhaustive research, and uh, an uncanny exploration of a very mysterious figure and also a, a misunderstood movement with uh, origins that have also often been uh, sort of widely misunderstood and propagated in historical texts for generations. And uh, I'm incredibly excited to help Dr. Dorman today uh, sort of share his research and uh, this new book. Of course, the pandemic uh, prevents some of the gallivanting that Dr. Dorman would have otherwise, uh, getting a chance to meet people up close and have those signed autograph uh, books and the, the questions of more intimate exchange. But uh, this allows him to sort of do a different sort of gallivanting all around the world, uh, oftentimes in, uh, in light speed. So he could appear in Chicago here and Atlanta there and, and New York and other places. What I wanted to do tonight is uh, uh, introduce Dr. Dorman, uh, allow him to have a conversation around his book and invite questions from those in attendance. The uh, feature in the, the chat, please note that you can submit questions anytime. There's a Q&A feature. If you see at the bottom of your screen, at any point you can submit questions. We will have the Q&A towards the end of the presentation. Also, uh, there's a link to the seminary co-op in Chicago where one can buy the book. That's in the chat room. And uh, please feel free to uh, do that at any time. And uh, what I first want to do is introduce someone whose scholarship is, I, I've followed his scholarship for years, got a chance to meet him years ago at a conference on the Harlem Renaissance and he presented an outstanding paper. And I was uh, so enthused with his paper and I invited him to contribute to this volume and it came out and I ever give book talks, his chapter is one of the chapters, one of the three or four chapters I always read something from of a 14 chapter volume. It was um, a very insightful analysis of everyday people in Harlem and the granular exploration of the lives of people in Harlem and looking at data, it was so revealing and it disrupts how many people have a romantic view of uh, the Harlem Renaissance or the new Negro era, new Negro Renaissance. And that, that intervention that Dr. Dorman did there is the sort of interventions that we find in scholarship uh, throughout. So he earned his BA with highest honors from Stanford University in 1996, where he studied with esteemed celebrated historians like Clay Warren Carson and George Fredrickson, Sylvia Winter and others. He earned his PhD in US history with an emphasis in African American history from the University of California at Los Angeles in 2004. And his uh, first book, which is a widely celebrated book, uh, Chosen People, The Rise of American Black Israelite Religions, was released with Oxford University Press in 2013. It won numerous prizes, including the Wesley Logan Prize from the American Historical Association, the 2014 Albert J. Rabateau Book Prize from the Best Book in Africana Religions, and the Brian Caldwell Smith Book Prize from the University uh, of Kansas. He uh, has written all sorts of other articles and his uh, book chapters appear in places uh, far and wide. And uh, this book, uh, Beacon Press, released last year, The Princess and the Prophet, A Tale of Magic, Muslims in America, it sets the history of this the American Muslim movement in the 1920s and emergence of this movement with a broad cultural history of Islam and Orientalism in American life, going back to the late 19th century, coming into the early 20th century. It looks at uh, a hidden life, if you will, of noble Drew Ali. And what I find really fascinating about this narrative is the ways in which uh, Dr. Dorman uncovers, when I say this, and this, this may sound cliche, to say, oh, well, you know, he provides this great intervention. Uh, this is a wonderful way, a reinterpretation of some of the information. But this is not just a reinterpretation of information, but an excavation of entirely new bodies of research. And so the, uh, what we have here is histor historiography at its best. We get a chance to see an entirely new picture, new dimensions 
again, the discursive histories of a very complex, mysterious movement. And it's, it sounds in some ways odd to say a mysterious movement for something that appears in every single broad history of African Americans in the 20th century. Everything from slavery to freedom or, or any uh, African American survey will talk about the Moorish Science Temple of America and Nobu Ali and 1913 and New Jersey. And we find that it's much more complicated, is much more nuanced, and there's a lot more going on than what we've typically recitated in so many texts uh, for generations. So for that sort of thing, this is what we call, call very serious history. And I appreciate Dr. Dorman for your very serious historical contribution. So welcome, Dr. Dorman, uh, the floor is yours. And, uh, and give us a little overview of your book and uh, tell us a little about the, about the project. And um, oftentimes in these conversations, people can begin by saying what ultimately brought them to the project, but you might actually have uh, your own presentation to sort of give us an overview of the book first. And then I can ask some questions like that later. So the floor is yours, thank you. Terrific, thank you so much, Dr. Ogbar. It's, it's a pleasure to see you and to hear you talk. I, I just don't want you to stop. It sounds so good when you talk about my book. Um, I, I'd, I'd love it to continue. Um, I wanna start by saying thank you, welcome, and offer my uh, heartfelt assalamu alaikum and shalom aleichem to everybody listening. Um, I wanna thank all, all the Muslims listening to this uh, for preserving um, the Islamic traditions um, and for your contributions that you make both to this country and, and to the world. Um, I started out um, writing about this uh, during the Iraq war and I thought that was in as about a bad a time as I could imagine and in some ways this time is worse but now I think uh, at least there's hope that um, we can start to have a, a new conversation and a new reality. And part of that I think is to deal with uh, the truth and the fact of racism and the necessity for discussion and, and for um, reparations. And so that's mindset that I come from. Um, and when I was you know, witnessing the Iraq war, I actually, I dropped out of grad school to try to stop the Iraq war uh, the Iraq war didn't care and it just kept going. <laughs> I got myself, you know, arrested and et cetera. Um, but that experience was um, mo really motivational for me and wanting to understand more about Islam and, and the way that this country has perceived and really misperceived Islam through this discourse that Edward Said called um, Orientalism. And what what I noticed, because I was already studying the, the Hebrew Israelites um, in Harlem in the 1920s, number one, there was a lot of overlap between people who call themselves black Jews and people who call themselves black Muslims. Sometimes you had rabbis who were observing Ramadan, for, for instance. Um, and I realized that the, the exterior container of Judaism or Islam didn't describe the full um, depth of the, the content of these movements. So I started writing my first book and I thought I would write about African-American Jews and Muslims. Uh, and then that got to be too large and unwieldy. And so um, this book really comes out of trying to understand a very important question, which is how did the Moorish Science Temple uh, amass perhaps as many as 15,000 members, right? The most conservative estimate is 7,000. The, the perhaps more precise estimate is 15,000 members between 1925 and 1929. So how did that happen? And a lot of scholars have tackled that question, um, but none I thought had really answered it. Um, so I started out to write about what did it mean what was the idea of Islam in the 1925? And what was the idea of the Moors? What did it mean to be a Moor? What did, what did the average person on the street know about the Moors? And what did African-Americans specifically um, say about Islam? Um, and so that took me, you know, I wrote an article about Blyden. I wrote an article about uh, Duz or Duze Muhammad Ali. It's actually currently under, under review right now. Uh, 
So I basically had to write a book in order to write a book. I, I did that with both my, my first two books. So I wrote essentially an entire book just about the intellectual landscape of Islam in, in America, in, among African Americans, and in the Af Africa and the African diaspora. And out of that, I thought what I was doing was just kind of writing um, a prequel to the Moor Science Temple, to the, the life and times of uh, the prophet Noble Drew Ali. Uh, but, and, and the reason why is because, as, as you mentioned, so many books mention the prophet Noble Drew Ali. So many books talk about the Moors. Uh, I thought everything had been written uh, about them. And I read books, you know, by members of the Moors. I read books by, by scholars outside the Moors. But when I uh, was in the process of doing my research, I found a picture of a young man, young, uh, a man who at the time would have been called Negro, who Moors would call Moors or Asiatic, um, in 1900, uh, in the circus. And um, I found a picture of him and his wife, and I started doing research. And his name was Walter Brister. His wife's name was Eva Alexander Brister. Um, actually, Eva Alexander Hammond Brister. And then she remarries in 1919 to Alan. So she's married multiple times. Um, but uh, I, through them then and the resources of, at the time, what was called the W.B. Du Bois uh, Institute at Harvard, uh, I got access to ProQuest and, and different historical newspapers and a lot of microfilm. And I was able to trace the, the career and show business of um, Eva and Walter Brister and demonstrate, at least to my own satisfaction, that Walter Brister indeed became uh, Noble Drew Ali. Um, and it's, I think, an amazing story that kind of takes you through everything from uh, the history of magic, Islam, the history of capitalism and its expansion, the history of entertainment, uh, the tented, uh, you know, minstrelsy from tented shows, circuses, uh, Wild West shows, uh, all the way up until the kind of the, the nitty gritty politics of Chicago and the South Side um, in, in the 1920s in the era of Al Capone and even more powerful people kind of behind the scenes that people don't know as much about. Um, so if you like, I mean, we could keep, we could do questions and answers or I could just read a little piece. What would you prefer? Why don't you read a little piece and then uh, I'll toss some questions out and get some questions from the audience. All right. And um, I think that some of your excerpts will generate a number of questions from the crowd. Okay. All right, I'm gonna read one of my favorite parts of the book and it's a part that doesn't get talked about very much. There's a lot of parts of this book that don't get talked about like, like the whole Chicago. I mean, it's half the book is about Chicago and the nitty gritty uh, inner workings of that. But I wanna talk about, um, about the kind of the, the bigger context because one of the central insights of the book, and this isn't really news to anyone who actually follows uh, Islam, especially among African-Americans, is that Islam was a central element of uh, resistance to European imperialism and to US racism. So to identify as a Muslim in the 1920s was to identify with a, a global civilization that was ancient, that was venerable, that uh, was held in respect, even if it was sometimes uh, horrifically caricatured. But it was to, you know, have a lifeline internationally, to make a claim outside of so-called Western civilization, um, a, a claim on an ancient civilization that was inherently anti-racist, right? Because of the prophet, uh, of the example of. Uh, the, the prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. So at his example of interracial fellowship and communion, going back to Bilal, his companion. 
And so this was, you know, this is not just, you know, a figment of contemporary scholars' imaginations. This is right in the source text from the 1920s and even earlier, especially when you talk about a figure like the Reverend uh, Edward Wilmot Blighting. You know, he was saying Islam is uh, to be a force to be reckoned with and it is anti-racist and it might be the best religion for black people. Eventually he comes to a position like that. So, but this is, this is me kind of channeling a little bit of E.P. Thompson and Robin D.G. Kelly for the Cognizati. Okay, modern capitalism transformed life in the 18th and 19th centuries, uprooted peasant societies globally, created sprawling factory-filled and soot-choked cities in rapidly industrializing urban cores, enslaved millions of Africans and their descendants in the Americas, colonized millions more people globally, disenchanted the natural world with scientific and technological accomplishments, and transformed older mercantile colonies into imperial regimes for the extraction of the raw materials that fed metropolitan factories. Supernatural magic was one of the many peasant traditions that interfered with capitalist labor discipline worldwide. In this context, the degree to which people allegedly practice magic became a potent index of their primitiveness, allegedly, and a powerful indictment of their readiness for self-rule and civilization. According to English geographer Charles Middleton, magical rituals were benighted practices, quote, which mankind naturally follow who are not acquainted with physics, history, and true religion. European Protestants came to see the rest of the world's peoples as magical and hence uncivilized. Prophet Noble Drew Ali would teach that race was a fiction and that the only race was the human race. Today, most scholars would agree with him. Europeans of the 19th century invented their own so-called scientific theories of race that in retrospect seem not just as spear, not just as spurious as witchcraft, but in truth, far less sophisticated. And then I talk about some of these like the absolutely ridiculous things that so-called racial scientists used to do like fill up craniums with peppercorns and then count the peppercorns and then say Europeans have the biggest heads therefore they must be smartest as if like the way to find the smartest person in the room is you know go find Andre the giant and say well he must be this and maybe he was a very smart man I don't know but it's just absurd Right. The other thing is, uh, in this one collection, it was only male Caucasians, so-called Caucasians, in the collection, and only female Africans. And lo and behold, the Europeans had the biggest. So I go into this kind of like witchcraft of racism, which um, Barbara Fields calls racecraft. And I could go into that. That's a really, I think, a really interesting point. Um, the dichotomy between magical primitives and capitalist moderns was so firmly etched in the 19th century imagination that Karl Marx could effectively cast doubt on capitalism by blurring such categories. In 1848, he wrote that modern bourgeois capitalism had, quote, conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange that it is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells, end quote. Capitalist modernity was born of the rationalist attempt to master the natural world through science and the abstemious effort to make money multiply through intellectual abstraction, capitalization in corporations, and long distance exchange. But the inventions, cities, wars, and new social forms of capitalism uh, that capitalism produced were so new violent, vast, and difficult to comprehend that they seem to introduce ever greater forms of mystification, not less. The 19th century's bloom of occult traditions with allegedly ancient origins and often fanciful documentation were part of a larger pattern during the Industrial Revolution. Amid all the social upheaval, migration, and labor strife, Victorians hungered for new traditions of spur spuriously ancient provenance even when, as in the case of Scottish tartan kilts, they had to be, they had to make up those traditions out of whole cloth. 
and talk about the, the lodges and this kind of divide and then the rise of the occult and its association with um, uh, socialism. The Victorian era's occult uh, religious movements, especially the variant of Indian religion known as theosophy, presented Indian, Buddhist, and other quote unquote Eastern ideas. Likewise, likewise, its stage magicians performed a wide variety of oriental magic in European and American theaters, marking a very literal return of what colonialism had repressed. Travelers to British colonial India had long marveled at the feats of the fakirs who lay on beds of nails, walked on hot coals, charmed snakes from baskets, ate glass, made mango trees appear to grow and bear fruit instantaneously, and made boys disappear inside wicker baskets. Now, European and American magicians began performing such tricks in theaters, in circus sideshows, and in amusement parks, usually wrapping their heads in turbans, decking themselves out in oriental finery, and using the mystique of the Far East to entrance Western audiences. The first stage magician's journal published in America called itself the Mahatma and was filled with learned disquisitions and exposés on the workings of oriental magicians. One American magician who started performing Hindu magic at Chicago's World Columbian Exposition of 1893 later made a name for himself by con uh, converting escape magic, transforming it from the ropes of fairground fakirs to the manufactured locks and chains of the 20th century reaching back a hundred years to borrow the name of the father of stage magic, a name that also conjured up Hindu magic. He called himself Harry Houdini. And uh, both side notes, so that's pretty much the end of that. But uh, Walter Brister, uh, as Arma Sotanki, uh, wrote a letter that ended up in the collection of Harry Houdini that's now at the uh, University of Texas. So that's a little pretext. Um, but maybe what I should do is, is give an outline of the life of Walter Brister a, a little bit more in detail. Um, Walter Brister, and then we can do um, Q&A. Uh, Walter Brister was born in Kentucky. In 1893, he became the first Black child star on Broadway. Um, I got to say, though, he really was the first Black star on Broadway. Um, Unfortunately, his, his contribution hasn't been recognized uh, thus far, but he was the star of a band, a juvenile uh, band that was called a Piccaninny band. And, you know, which was offensive enough at the time that African-American newspapers prefer the term juvenile. Um, but that was the term that was used uh, in that day. Um, and this was the first time that Black children had played on stage. And Broadway, you have to appreciate that this is before Hollywood existed. So Broadway was the biggest form of entertainment. Uh, it was even, you know, this is bigger than vaudeville. I mean, this was like, it was like being a star in the movies. And Walter Brister was the, the bandmaster. He was the son of the, the um, band leader. And he, his success was so phenomenal that um, for Christmas of the first year, management produced a bronze statue to him. So it was the, then the success of this band in old Kentucky's band that led to all these imitators. Like in, there was like in old Georgia and old South Carolina and old, you name it. And that led to this fad for black child bands. Um, so when Louis Armstrong picked up a cornet as part of the, the New Orleans home for uh, colored waifs, he was following in the footsteps of Walter Brister. I mean, that's really how foundational Brister was um, and, and the success of this band that led to like dozens, by dozens of imitating uh, shows. So by World War I in Old Kentucky was considered the most popular show in American history. So it was like Les Mis, Cats, and Hamilton just rolled into one. But the thing is, because he was uh, impersonating a child, he was 14 when he started. Um, so by the time he got to be 18, he basically aged out of that band and he needed a new role. And that's when he became Arma Sotanki. 
And that's also when uh, he was about 20, I guess, when he marries, um, uh, becomes Armas Otenki and then marries Eva Brister, who's also a magician. And then they have this amazing life in, um, in entertainment. And then the events of 1913, 1914 are, are really interesting. Um, and I think since I have a few minutes till we're halfway done with this sh show, I think I'll read a little bit um, from the section about this, this the years 1913, 1914. Um, the next two times Walter Brister surfaces in the historical record are perplexing and frankly difficult to explain. In November of 1912, six months after Brister started in the Chicago Company of Southland, that was a, uh, he was playing trumpet again in um, Chicago in 1912. George Slaughter published a mysterious review of a Princess Sotanke performance in Louisville, Kentucky. Princess Sotanke gets them in a big way with her mammoth snake when she does the sacred dance of death, he began. But then he dropped a bombshell. This will be the last week of the princess's stage career as she will retire for life. She is the prospective bride of a successful magnate in, of Asbury Park, New Jersey. We will see the little princess in the future assisting in managing, managing business affairs in the interest of her husband's enterprise as her past stage career, career will be of great benefit to him. There are a number of things that are askew about this notice. The most glaring of them is the fact that Princess Otanke was still married to Walter Brister. The other is that the princess did not leave the stage. She, in fact, performed until 1921. But what is even more interesting is that Asbury Park is in the vicinity of Newark, New Jersey, where an Islamic lodge known as the Canaanite Temple is said to have appeared in 1913. Could this planned business enterprise uh, that Slaughter referred to have been the forerunner of the Moorish Science Temple. By communicating so openly such a patently false story, was Slaughter even announcing uh, the new plan to the friends who knew Princess Otanke's real identity as Eva Brister, Walter's wife? The story took another twist two years later in April 25th, uh, 1914, when the following notice appeared in the Indianapolis Freeman. Walter Brister, the cornet player, died Wednesday 8th at his late residence on, in Chicago after a short illness. His wife, Princess Otanke, the oriental dancer and snake charmer, on hearing of her husband's illness, hurried to his bedside from Indianapolis, where she had been appearing, and nursed him until he died. There was a death certificate filed with Cook County that matched the story in the newspaper, but given the Sotanke's histories of magical deception and wonder working, their expertise at making people disappear into a basket or float in midair, was Brister dead or was this merely a more elaborate dance of death like Princess Sotanke performed with the giant snake that would allow Walter Brister or Arma Sotanke to escape a tight spot in Chicago and reinvent himself once again? Princess Sotanke did not stop her dance of death, at least not yet. Like her husband, she was part of a community of performers of color, people then known as Negro, who plied their trades on the vaudeville and circus circuits, the circus circuits, and communicated with each other through the pages of the trade newspapers. On January 2nd, 1915, George Barrett, a veteran of the venerable Fisk University Jubilee Singers, placed a message in the newspapers read by black show business people reading, Mr. George Barrett sends regards to Princess Sotanke and says, hello, Drew, look out for Ali Mona. He's got some juggling act. There was someone named Drew then who was part of Princess Sotanke's troupe in 1915. And he was in the same line of work as a juggler, which means a magician named Ali Mona. Was this the man who would become Noble Drew Ali, and was he the Walter Brister who officially died in 1914? Eva Brister's association with Walter survived his fictional demise, but their marriage did not last. Now officially a widow for the second time, Eva remarried a uh, African-American laborer named Adam Allen in Cincinnati in 1919. 
then I go into more about the, the whole transition that was happening at this in this era of um, southern tented you know minstrelsy and tented shows uh, like Silas Green from New Orleans and then how with the Great Migration that actually disrupts these um, these circuits and um, a lot of entertainers and, and magicians move up, follow the Great Migration up and start um, uh, providing religious services um, for African American migrants. And indeed, um, Walter Brister, under his brother's name, um, Thomas Drew, would do the same in the Harlem Renaissance before becoming um, Noble Drew Ali. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Jake. I, um, again, I want to sort of underscore the, the reception of this book. And before I go into some questions I have and opening it up for others, and just to remind people that you can use the Q&A option at the bottom of the page. You can type in your questions and I can read them uh, to Jake. Uh, and we do have a question in there. I wanted to just, uh, I'll read one review from a, uh, a colleague and mentor to some of us. I was on a, on a panel actually earlier today with him and I see his book is over your left shoulder, Race Rebels. Mm -hmm. So uh, Robin and I were on a panel earlier and I just thought it'd be appropriate to sort of uh, say a little bit about what he said about your book. He said that Jacob Dorman's death and riveting historical thriller demonstrates everything we thought we knew about the man, his equally mysterious wife and the movement he led. The journey through continents and circus tents, barbershops and back rooms, millennia of religious traditions and an ersatz orient embodied in the flesh of black pretenders. The princess and the prophet itself, a prodigious feat of detective work and archival magic. A spectacular book in so many ways. Robin D.G. Kelly. And that's a, it's a, it's a very glowing review and uh, I thought it would be apt to, uh, to, to read that as we sort of uh, get into your book a little bit. So, one of the things I say in the introduction is that your book is not just a sort of reinterpretation of the materials, like what we know about Noble Draw Lee, but an excavation of something entirely new. So we know all these new things. And so I'm fascinated by the, the creation of an entirely new identity, new person, new backstory, and all this. And we see this in entertainment. So it's not unique. And mm -hmm. in the annals of American history, there are all sorts of people, some of whom uh, just tweak a little bit, right? So. Mm -hmm. HBO has this new thing on Ronald Reagan, just aired on Sunday, and uh, Ronald Reagan was in World War II in the military, never left the United States. He was in Los Angeles, but he spoke about us four times away and coming back to the country and coming back to see a changed uh, Los Angeles or coming back and seeing a changed uh, country, which was, um, of course, intimating that he was uh, away. And so he, he kind of crafted a different history, which many people have done, uh, public figures of various sorts for various reasons. But in this case, we have someone who uh, comes up with an identity and places him in, a, in North Carolina and a, a, a date of birth, and he has this town and everything. So in your research, what do you find to corroborate or to disprove that there was ever someone, um, a, a, a noble down in North Carolina who was born in 18, I believe, was it 1886, I believe? Was that the, the year he gave? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and right. so, yeah, did you find, what can you say about the sort of the, the cardboard character that he claims uh, is his history, which of course is discordant with what you found with the guy from Kentucky under a different name, yeah. Walter Brister. Okay, yeah, so this is kind of a, a question about the process of creating, of making this story. Um, and it's also, you know, thank you, it's a, it's a really, Good question. Um, and first of all, I have to acknowledge, you know, like that you know, receiving that glowing blurb from Robin D.G. Kelly was, you know, one of the professional highlights of my life. And it feels to me better than winning a book award. Um, it's just, you know, you know, how, how we think about Robin Kelly and his work and just how it's like a torch in the darkness it's just and it keeps on happening to me that i'll read something from him and it just 
illuminates this whole vista like he's so far ahead and then i look at the date and it's like 1997 <laughs> like, how did how does this guy do this like he's just yeah, he's like he's like 28 years old or something right yeah he's 28 years know, old back then he's been 34 but yeah i get the point yeah yeah it's just see you know his birth date that's the, <laughs> the degree of it um so yeah it really it's really wonderful um, and to have you know, that kind of uh, statement from somebody whose work means so much um, to me. And it, I would hope that um, anyone listening to this will go and pick up Race Rebels, uh, which is, I think, the, the place to the en entry point for uh, rotten, the, the, the work of Robin D.G. Kelly. But then, you know, letter just articles, sometimes just newspaper think pieces that he's written have totally changed the whole way that I look at the world. And a good example of that, and this gets to the process question, is polyculturalism. Because I read a piece that, that Robin Kelly, Dr. Professor Robin Kelly wrote um, in a magazine, like an anti-racist magazine called Color Lines. And it was called The People in Me. And he talks about the people in me, in, in him, and he talks about a version of ancestry based on and an and impact based on polyculturalism rather than multiculturalism that says basically that we are all inheritors of, of culture, beliefs, ideas, religion, music, um, that not just from you know, our genealogical ancestors, but from a whole range of people and from peers as well. And, um, you know, I read something similar in a book by Vijay Prashad. And in my first book, I really used, I theorized polyculturalism, you know, I, I gussied it up with all the, you know, Debord and Bourdieu and, and all the, the big names of theory and, and Levi Strauss and whatnot to talk about polycultural bricolage. That is, not everybody, but certain cultural empresarios are able to piece together novel worldviews. And, but the way they do that is by finding similar things in no matter where they, they are found. So in my study of the 1920s and religious kind of visionaries of the 20s, you know, they're reading everybody. And they don't care what, you know, the race of the person writing the book, like they're reading books about magic by Andrew, by, by Europeans, they're reading um, books about, you know, uh, conjuring, they're reading, they're practicing conjuring, they're doing a whole range of things. Uh, Dolores is this great, great character in, in alternative religion, whose books he publishes esoteric books. Uh, William Larone or Larone William Dolores, now he looked like a white man, but when he was uh, arrested, he claimed that he was Choctaw and the police in Chicago called him a Negro. And he was arrested because he was having, not just was he having orgies in Chicago in 1911, but he was having interracial orgies. And he had this cult that there was an inside part of the cult was, was all black and the outside part of the cult was all white. And his books, uh, were used in Santaria, Vodou, uh, among Black Muslims, Black Israelites, They're, they turn up in Africa, Rastafarians, they're all reading these books. So I thought polycultural, this Robin Kelly's idea of polyculturalism was, and Vijay Prashad was really apt for talking about um, ancestry and inheritance and cultural creation. And that made me think that a lot of the, the work, as you know, right, there's a lot of work on the African diaspora that has been trying to find connections of, or African retentions. But the metaphor of retention is basically based on a biological metaphor of genetic ancestry and inheritance, you know, what you inherit. Uh, and that's what I go into in the first book. And instead, polyculturalism is looking much more at how people create cultures and ideas in, and recreate culture and ideas in every generation. And so this is a long way of saying when I read books about African-American Muslims, they were always talking about African Muslims, enslaved African Muslims, 
and then there would be this kind of lacuna like between you know 1865 and then 1925 and then the more science temple happens and there's a few other groups as people in the know people who are knowledgeable about this know about the, the Ahmadis um, and there were a few there's a Trinidadian sheikh who was um, trying to in, uh, um, spread Islam there's a few white converts to Islam but basically the the how the more science temple happened so long after um, the end of the slave trade had never really been answered. And so because of my belief and commitment to polycultural theory, I thought maybe we're kind of asking the wrong question because instead of trying to draw lineal connections of genetic descent to Muslim ancestors, which is kind of the, the retention approach, instead of that, maybe what we really ought to be doing is asking what did Islam mean to, the, to, to black people in the 1920s or Moorish or Asiatic people in the, in, in the 1920s? What did it mean to be Muslim? And so to answer that, then you have to look at pop culture. So I looked at movies, I looked at sheet music, I looked at newspaper articles, I looked at religious tracts, I looked at these kind of visionaries. And there was, uh, I found in the circus, a whole tradition presenting not just Muslims, but Moors specifically. And these people were, um, they were there as acrobats, as equestrians, horse riders, uh, you name it. So I started doing research in the circus. There also, there, there was one uh, report in the ANP, the Associated Negro Press, uh, right when the prophet died in 1929, that said that he had been in a circus and he had accompanied a Hindu fakir in a circus. And then he decided, decided to start an order of his own. So following up just that like one sentence, that's the only thing I had to go on. And I started going to every circus uh, archive that I could find. And that's how I find, found the Bristers and then was able to bring them together. Uh, so, so just to be clear, was there ever any um, identity that you could found, you found with a, a Drew, a Timothy Drew that predated uh, Brister? Like in 1913, did you find like, you know, birth certificates, yeah. death certificates, or family, or yeah. people. Because I'm wondering, did, did he take someone else's identity? He create something all together. Okay, well, here I have to give credit to two people who were grad students when they did this amazing genealogical work, and that's Patrick Bowen and Ali Fathi Abdat, um, or Fathi Ali Abdat, excuse me. Fathi uh, was in Singapore, still is in Singapore hopefully is watching or will watch this. And he had access only to Ancestry.com. And, and Patrick Bowen was uh, at a, a school in Denver, also had Ancestry. And using basically, I believe, only Ancestry, although Patrick has done a lot of extensive, extensive research on Islam um, and African-American and in connection with Islam. Um, but they were able to connect Noble Drew Lee to Professor Thomas Drew. So the, his origin story was always that he was named Timothy Drew, but Patrick and Fathi were able to show that it was, he was connected with Thomas Drew. So they uncovered Thomas Drew um, in the 1900 census in Norfolk, uh, Virginia as a, still a child, uh, probably I think around seven years old. No, I'm sorry, older than that. I'd have to check. Um, now, Thomas Drew's mother was named Lucy. And it says in the census that Thomas Drew is adopted. His father becomes James Drew. So I don't think anyone's been able to connect the Norfolk Drews to the North Carolina Drews, but they easily could have been. I mean, they could have just traveled up uh, for work to Norfolk. So now the reason why that's so uh, um, consequential is because Walter Brister's mother was named Lucy. And I was able to show that Lucy's marriage to Walter's father broke up in the 1890s at the same moment when this Lucy takes up with James Drew, marries James Drew with her adopted son, Thomas. 
Um, so that that's part of the so that allows me to argue that Walter and Brister, Walter Brister and Thomas Drew were both uh, the children of Lucy and probably of both Lucy and John Henry Brister. So they probably were full brothers, but that uh, I, we would need to find the marriage certificate of James Drew and Lucy Brister to, um, to, to be 100% on that. But that okay. seems to make um, the most sense to me. Okay, uh, I would like to read, I know I'm not sure, I think we're running through time here. So I guess for, for brevity, I'll push through some comments, uh, some questions we have from the audience. And we have a question here. Since you wrote two books about two different religions, with your viewpoint, do you really believe that Islam and Muslims at the time motivated people to break free from slavery? That's the question. Okay, I should, I, this is like one of those, one of those, uh, what's the word, sort of um, rhetorical questions by somebody that wants to, you know, get into some historical argument about the role of Islam and the slave trade. My book isn't about the role of Islam and the slave trade. I think you should just read books about Islam and the slave trade. And also, I guess it's, it's useful to note that the, the period you cover is long after slavery is already abolished. So it's not um, breaking away from slavery, but if I'm not mistaken, if I, um, as someone who's studied Islam and written about it as well, um, people have certainly used it to be a resistive force against oppression sure. even after slavery. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm really writing about is the era of European colonialism. Um, and I mean, I, I've taken, I've read a lot of books about Africa and the slave trade. I was t taught by one of the best scholars of African slave trade uh, as an undergrad. Um, I could go on about that, but I think that's just pulling away focus from the point is in the 19th century, Islam spread in West Africa as explicitly as a form of resistance to European colonialism. And that's just, that's just a fact. And because of that, um, and, and then into the 20th century and the kind of jockeying for position of what was going to happen to the lands of the um, former Ottoman Empire, Islam was seen as a real threat um, to the West by, by U.S. racists like Lothrop Stoddard, who wrote this book, The Rising Tide of Color, about how people of color, they're rising and now there's going to be some a racial war. His next book was all about Islam. So the kind of contemporary Islamophobia of Steve Bannon and his ilk really goes back to the 1920s and people like Lothar Stoddard. Um, and, and, and conversely, you know, when African Americans were identifying as Muslims, there was a political uh, facet to that. It was anti, explicitly anti-racist. Yeah, uh, my question, if we, if we have time, will relate exactly to that. So here's a question here. Um, hi, Jake, your colleague at UNR. Uh, UNR, Pardis uh, Dashabi here. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I'm so excited to read your book. I'm a literary scholar, a Muslim, Muslim one as it happens. And what strikes me as being the case in the English departments is that despite the rich and long history of convergence between the Arab slash Muslim world and African Americans, there's still a disciplinary tendency, at least in the English departments, to compartmentalize the study of these two spheres. This has more to do, it seems to me, with disciplinary and institutional habits than it does with the actual history, as your book so clearly shows and beautifully. Uh, could you tell us if this tendency exists in history departments too? If so, why? If not, why not? Thank you, Jake, wonderful talk. Okay, so the, the question is, the two spheres are which and which? Yeah, so uh, says that it seems, at the end, uh, this seems to me, um, it links the English departments to compartmentalize the study of these two spheres, right? Yeah, the but, studies but, of Islam. Yeah, Islam. and want to know if, yeah, in English departments, uh -huh. um, studying the history convergence between uh, the Muslim world and African Americans, uh 
this person notes it's a tendency, at least in English, to compartmentalize the study of these two spheres. Apparently, studying okay. Okay. the Muslim world and Arab here, yeah, yeah, here, but yeah. want to know if this tendency exists in history departments too. Okay, and if so, why or why not? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you, sadly, you the um, unfortunately, too. there's all kinds of compartmentalization. Like people, you know, most people won't read my book because they think, oh, it's about religion and I don't study and or care about religion. Or they'll not read the book because they'll say, I'm a Muslim and, and we don't believe in, you know, prophets after the prophet. And so I'm not interested. Or they'll, I mean, there's a million reasons why people disqualify books and I think that this book I, just tries to bridge some of these interests because really I'm a I'm a I'm a historian, you know, and but I'm also I taught in American studies um, for ten years, so I have great kind of respect for the American studies method and for literature. Um, and just in general, there's a kind of um, fragmentation of the academy, and this is actually something that my um, professor Sylvia Winter talked about as being not just incidental, but really a core part to the crisis that we're facing in the so-called Western world uh, right now, that we have this intense compartmentalization. You know, I think a lot of it goes back to the kind of the triumph of capitalism and, and, and it's kind of capitalistic thinking that invades every area of life, including intimacy and love. And it invades, uh, you know, leads to the climate crisis. It leads to the racial crisis. It, um, it's it's a part of a problem of not thinking holistically. Um, so, in my small way, I'm trying to write a book that's, you know, it's about Islam. It's about the history of Islam, but it's also about magic. It's also about capitalism. It's also about Chicago politics and gangsters and graft, which little did I know it would be such excellent preparation for understanding the last four years of uh, American politics. But, you know, graft is endemic to, to this, our society. And, and the Moors, I think part of the brilliance of Noble Drew Lee was figuring out how to negotiate Chicago um, corruption and how to recruit some of the most elite members of uh, Chicago's black political class into the Moorish Science Temple, and then how to, you know, amass 15,000 members. I mean, that's really remarkable to do that in five years. And so I think that all of that, as well as his earlier life, helps to testify to his incredible charisma and to his effectiveness. And I think that uh, you know, if you believe that uh, the prophet Noble Drew Lee was a holy prophet and divinely inspired, then nothing about the book should disabuse you of that. I just think that it's adding an earlier chapter. It's like the carpentry chapter of Jesus's life. You know, he was a carpenter and that's part of his story and transformation. And, you know, developing charisma for 40 years or 30 years in entertainment uh, is was part of the preparation um, that Walter Brewster used in transforming himself into Noble Drew Lee. But yeah, Pardis, I would I'd agree. We have a huge segmentation, fragmentation in the Academy as in everything else. So we have uh, two two other questions here. I'll figure out, uh, we'll go quickly through these uh, last two. Uh, thank you for the research. How did or why did the Moore Science Temple and Noble Drew Lee become so politicized focused on black economic empowerment on black what black economic empowerment so um how did it become yeah. or why did it become and this is how it's framed how did or why did the more science temple become so politicized and focused on black economic empowerment well i mean this immediately brings to mind the marcus garvey movement some scholars have actually made the claim that the more science temple was just like a fragment of the of the Garvey movement, which I think is wrongheaded. <laughs> but it is of the times to think about black economic self-sufficiency. I mean, this is following the you know the red summer of 1919, where there were race riots, which really meant you know white people uh, killing black people all over um, the U.S. 
um, you had the, kind of the collapse of the dream of World War I that, you know, black people would, you know, finally um, be granted citizenship and an intensification of um, a kind of Booker T. Washington um, mode of um, emphasizing economic self-sufficiency. And the thing to add there is that, you know, Noble Drew Lee was, doesn't get enough credit for his economic achievements. I mean, he made, in today's dollars, he made something like $2 million a year, rough estimate. Um, he was wealthy at the time of his death. Um, he, you know, his businesses were more successful than Garvey's businesses. Garvey was like a Jeff Bezos in terms of his vision, but he didn't have like the, the cadres of people to really carry out the vision. Noble Drew Lee figured out how to get it done. And also part of that is how to work with white gangsters, not with, but work in an environment that was dominated by gangsters in Chicago. Wow. Okay. Um, this question here. Um, what did your research and your new findings reveal about the role of gender in more assigned couples? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. What did your research and your new findings reveal about the role of gender in the more assigned couples? Um, well, I got to say that I I didn't do a tremendous amount on gender in the more science simple. I mean, I think Judith Wisenfeld's book, um, New World of Coming is really excellent on that. Um, but, you know, part of the thing is that Judith and other scholars that have written about gender in the more science simple have usually looked at oral histories and records from the 1930s, uh, more so than the 1920s. Um, I mean, I could, I could make some kind of obvious observations that they might, um, uh, I don't know. I, I think that the, the really interesting thing about gender that my book reveals is more, has a lot more to do with the life of Eva Brister, um, who I believe was in the Moore Science Temple because she's photographed at right next to, sitting right next to Noble Drew Lee in the famous 1928 convention photo. Um, she's identified as uh, Mamie Lomax, the wife of a Noble Drew Lee's rival, uh, James Lomax, who ends up fleeing the United States, going to Cairo, uh, coming back as Mohammed El Zaldin, and then founding many um, Sunni groups among African Americans. Just uh, like, I mean, his impact was almost as large as Elijah Muhammad, who was a member of the Moors in Detroit. But Eva Brister, you know, really was uh, an artist who toyed with ideas of gender in her artistry as a salon dancer. Um, she was probably the second most famous African-American salon dancer, which was a whole kind of species of um, uh, exotic oriental uh, dance. And she danced with a giant snake and she clearly was toying with ideas of Eros and Thanatos, what Freud would call Eros and Thanatos, but he wouldn't actually call them that until a decade after Eva Brister was acting out this whole um, um, uh, entrancing dance uh, where she pretended to be um, killed by the snake, the dance of death. And, and what I think is really notable about this, I guess this is a long way, long way to way of getting to this, is that I don't think most people recognize or understand that the Islamic world was a major source for challenging Western ideas of gender in this country, both inside and outside of the Moors and, and Islamic groups. You know, the first, um, the first American women to wear pants were called them Turkish pants or harem pants. And uh, perhaps ironically compared to the idea that many um, Westerners carry of Islam today, Islam was seen uh, to be sexually liberated, that you, you gotta think American women were wearing corsets and then they saw uh, women wearing Turkish pants, these free flowing pants, or which become bloomers, which become real sort of icons of women's physical and spatial liberation, because it meant they could you know, wear bicycles. So in a lot of, I think, unexpected ways, the ways that you know, Americans uh, who, who aren't 
Muslims think about Islam have changed and in some case just dramatically flipped so that Islam could have been seen as like kind of a, a fount of women's liberation is how it was really seen and perceived in uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Um, and now of course it's uh, the US went to war in Afghanistan to quote unquote liberate is Muslim women. So the whole, the whole uh, valence has shifted. Well, we are at our time. I want to say this is absolutely great. Wonderful job, Jacob. I really appreciate the, uh, the comments, the questions from the audience here. I'm sure if people were here, they'd give you a rounding, enthusiastic applause, but uh, we, we will virtually do that. Uh, fantastic job. Congratulations on the book again. I, I need to correct myself. I said it came out in 1919, excuse me, 2019. It was uh, this year. And I remember yeah. because I remember the pandemic disrupted your books. I remember your, your yeah. tours. So it came yeah. out right as the uh, national shutdowns were coming around. So yeah. uh, kudos, congratulations. Huh? It, it was the super and super Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, again, congratulations. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, please, I will remind you that you can uh, go in the chat. There's a link there. We can purchase the book uh, from the, uh, the Chicago Seminary Co-op. And uh, thank you again, Jacob. Thank you for coming out. Again. Have a good night. Thank you so much. And anyone who wants more information can also visit my um, uh, website, which is Princess and profit.com. Thank you so much.